Hi everybody. It's a beautiful sunny day here in the Bay Area. Thought I'd take our Mindset Monday outside. So good to have you here. Those of you who can be here, those of you who are listening later, thinking of you. That Memorial Day is a time for the families of those who either were, you know, involved in service or, you know, are remembering those in service. And it's also kind of this perfect holiday between Mother's Day and Father's Day for what I would love it to be a bit of a family day. So I'm hoping you're able to step away from your your regular rigmarole of responsibilities today, maybe get a moment outside with the kids. And I wanna share one of my deepest, most impactful practices that I have cultivated over the many, many years of working with children and also raising my own stepchildren and then later, you know, counseling all the different families. This is something, this is a key question, a key sort of perspective that I share with all of my clients privately or in my Family Foundations Immersion Program. So here it goes. Oftentimes, just like we can do with like medical conditions or, you know, um, like problems with, you know, conflicts with other adults and things, we can often read the symptoms or the signs and focus so much there, like let's say on, um, you know, the, the um, you know, soreness of your muscles or, which is a symptom, right? Or maybe um, the, 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 the thing that your coworker does that annoys you or <laughs> um, the uh, like bad household habit that your, your partner or um, you know, roommate has. And we can kind of focus on what's on the And with what we can do is we can also look at the more of the symptoms and even their, their expression to be literal. And with young children especially, it's really important that we don't, oh, there's my garden, um, that we don't, we don't mistake our, um, we don't mistake our children's um, expression of their needs as being a literal accurate reflection of their needs, right? So at times they, they are spot on. They'll say things like, go away, I don't wanna talk right now. And that's pretty clear, like that's a give me some space kind of message, right? other times they're just going oh or you know they or they're um saying i'm my foot hurts you know and what they really want something else <laughs> so i'm going to offering to you today a framework that is based on um uh Dreikers and also then jane nelson took it further and it's called the mistaking goals of behavior now i'm going to go deeper on this in my july motivation mastery weekend but um, i want to just give you a piece of this hi janae glad you're here yeah we'll go in our immersion but just a glance um, so that you can have this now and don't have to wait till July till our motivation mastery weekend so the idea is that kids are often have a goal behind their behavior it's called the mistaken goals of behavior is the framework okay so one of the goals of behavior that I think a lot of parents are really aware of is um, a desire for attention they want to get attention and it's a, it might be a symptom of feeling like a lack of attention right like they haven't felt seen and heard or maybe they felt misunderstood or overlooked lately um perhaps they're lonely especially in this time of being apart from their usual friends and other care providers that they're used to um and so attention is the first one we look out for the next one we look out for is power okay power because a lot of times children without even uh, without us even realizing we can really set up our our society can be set up our homes can be set up even our conversational tone that we use can really give kids the sense that they don't have much power and um, they're very egocentric people young children especially under eight um, and they they really do live in a world that centers around them and so when they don't have power over that world, it can create a lot of conflict and strife, yeah. So there's attention, and then there's power, and then the other one I'm going to um, cover today is revenge. Uh, revenge is where there's been a, an unaddressed hurt, and the child is acting out that this hurt has been unresolved. And it could be something as simple as, um, 
you know, they, they overheard a comment about them or maybe they didn't get the, the fair turn that they thought they deserved uh, in a game and they're just, they're hurt about it. They could be angry, f afraid, um, or, you know, hurt in some way and it's unresolved. And so they're acting that hurt out through, um, you know, basically to seek some kind of revenge. And revenge is kind of a charged word. And how I like to think of it though, is that their inside feels a certain way and they, they want, they're, they're trying to show that the outside feels that way too. But sometimes what they really are trying to do is get you to feel the way they feel so that maybe it'll draw attention to the deeper need for soothing and addressing the injury and, you know, resolving the conflict and doing the repair. So those three um, are, are really the ones that show up in some, kind of like the stronger behaviors, things like, you know, patterns of like they're, they're screaming or complaining a lot or um, other symptoms might be that they're really controlling and are bossy and like uh, say their, their first thing they say is no. Um, those, those tend to, or they seem to be like kind of acting out out of the blue. It doesn't really, it's not really making sense to the situation. So that's probably some carryover of revenge, re revenge feelings. So why, why have the, these goals in mind? Well, the whole idea is that if you can see that their mistaken goal of that behavior is attention, power, or revenge, then you can go kind of like, I like to think of it, I'm a very visual person. So I'm like the behavior's on the surface, but I really want to get to the root, right? Like, like when you're weeding your garden, you want to take the roots out. Otherwise the plant is still alive under there and it'll just come up again and again and again. <laughs> so again, we can address behavior. We can very much correct them or soothe them. But if we're not addressing the underlying need, it's not going to be as effective. Yeah. So just being able to start with this first piece of identifying what the need is that they need more attention, that they need more a sense, a greater sense of power, um, that they need to have a, a previous hurt addressed uh, thoroughly enough so that they feel like it's resolved. So keeping those three in mind, I mean, it could be anything from a sulky teenager who doesn't want to talk when they come in the door and go straight to their room to um, a three-year-old who will not stop antagonizing their brother or sister. You can still use this tool all the way up into adolescence. Um, as a matter of fact, in the older years, you know, age 10 and up, you can start to teach them that maybe perhaps what you want is not, um, you know, to always go first. Maybe perhaps what you want is a sense of like having power and influence on how the game is played and how it goes. Can we talk about that? Uh, you can do that with an eight year old and up. If you've got the little ones though, oftentimes you're the one who's holding that perspective and you are changing your approach um, accordingly. Hi, Asia, good to have you here. Um, so I'm wondering in the comments, if you're here and you're able to comment, like, what is a behavior your child has had recently? And what do you think it could be? Do you think it could be a seek seeking attention, seeking power, seeking revenge? Are any of those three sort of resonating with what you, the feeling tone of like what's coming up? Um, oftentimes it's, excuse me, it's how we respond to their behavior. That is also a really great clue. And I go in, in more depth than that on my Motivation Mastery Weekend and all of my immersion clients will also have that training um, where you can really start to say like, wow, use your own reaction. And I'll give you one, which is like, if you're finding yourself feeling annoyed or pestered, if you're finding yourself feeling guilty for turning your child away a lot, then attention is probably the one that's up, you know? Um, so that, that's one. And then I, it would, it would be, it would be a disservice to this work, this mistaken goals work to leave out the fourth one. So, so far we have attention, we have power, we have revenge. And again, put in the comments, even just one of those words, if you, as you think about a recent behavior of your child that you're like wanting to address or feel like you could have addressed better, you'd like to learn, you'd like to maybe, um, give them more support with, right? Um, so go ahead and, and share that in the comments, write it up for me so I can see. Um, and then I can respond to it. So the fourth one, drum roll, please. <laughs> Just kidding. Oh, it's too laid back today outside for, <laughs> for theatrics. But um, <laughs> the fourth one that I think is, is, is one of the hardest to um, sort of take a good look at, but is really important. It's, it tends to be more of the shutting down, the hiding, the withdrawing kinds of behaviors where, um, or, or a lot of negative self-talk, like things like, or even negative expression of, of self-worth, like saying things like, 
I'm not good at this. I'm never going to be good at this. Um, why should I even try? Um, it didn't, never works. Um, uh, he, like I'm not smart at that, right? Like could be a simpler version of that or, um, or just a lot of avoidance of like, I don't even want to try that activity. I don't even want to try on, try that activity. Right. I'm, I'm like going to, going to find a way to distract you from getting me to do that thing. Um, this is particularly, uh, particularly high stakes when it comes to, to skills and things that require competency. Like, um, it could be a whole area of school that they're avoiding. I've definitely had kids come in with this <clears throat> symptom of avoiding all, all math or avoiding all reading and, or avoiding art. Like they don't want to make art. Um, you know, in more of the social emotional world, I've had kids kind of show up shy where they don't want to talk to kids because they feel they're worried that they're not good at friendship. And the, the, the mistaken goal here is, or the mistaken sort of piece that's, that's the deeper thing that's happening is like an assumed inadequacy, an assumed inadequacy. In other words, they're coming into the situation with the mistaken belief that they are inadequate and that somehow put, putting effort or, or even like coming close to that that activity or that person is only going to bring is only going to confirm their their uh, assumption that they're inadequate at something and so they'd rather not even go there so if you have have a lot of and and the, the symptom again is that avoidance or or really um throwing throwing down and putting their foot down that 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 activity is not for them or that play date is not for them or that social situation is not for them um so sometimes it can be big and large, but this is the one that when you see it kind of in that quieter way of avoiding or hiding or withdrawing, it can often be this assumed inadequacy. And so when we, when we look at our children's behavior, you know, I often give a lot of tips on how to coach them in the moment and everything. And there's a lot of key questions we can ask, you know, things like, what do, what do I think my child is feeling right now? How can I address their emotions first? How far is their lid off? Being a lid detector. What do I most want my child to learn right now? But this is a new one, a new lens for you to look through. And it's the mistaken goals. And Janae is sharing with us, thank you. Long-term revenge is new to my mind. Yeah, it's like Eli has an ongoing tally. Oh gosh, you know, and with our our more sensitive children who have those soft spots and those triggers, like they often, t they do tend to sort of stockpile the injuries. And, um, and so for them, you know, that repair process is going to be so big and for them to be able to really express their, their feelings and feel through them and move them and maybe getting into, um, a groove. I'm thinking for you, Janae, especially for Eli of what kind of repair process actually leaves him feeling satisfied afterward. I had this student who was really a really deep, sensitive, very smart child, a lot like Eli, and um, she had a lot of soft edges. And um, I remember that I would, when, when there would be some kind of conflict in school where she wasn't feeling emotionally respected, you know, or wasn't feeling respected, she was like six at the time. So not that far off, Janae, from your Eli. Um, a lot of the children, we could sit together and we could talk it through once. And we, everybody's side was heard. Like, Janae, you learned in my conflict resolution module in the immersion la a couple months ago, right? Um, last month. That, you know, there's a kind of a process of repair where you can take turns, you know, listening and speaking and come up with maybe, a, um, you know, a win-win solution after you've acknowledged your impact, you know, things like that that we walked through. What I, the key question with kids who tend to tabulate and tend to stack up their hurt is this, this, this right here is checking in saying, do you feel resolved and complete with this? Or is this something that you would like me to check, check in with you about? And I was really noticing, especially this one, one girl with her softer edges that when I asked that question, it was like, we were, we turned a new page in our relationship. She felt so much more seen and heard and respected her mom about it she went home and she goes I just really trust Vanessa like I really trust that she's she's not just gonna have kids say an empty apology and then do nothing about what happened like and what I would do I would always make sure is that I would I would because um, she'd go home and she'd process her feelings through a bit more every every time something would happen the next morning I would check in with her I'd pull her aside and I was like how did that go for you how did it sit with you do you feel like you really got the apology you needed do you feel like you were able to say everything you need to say? 
um, do you feel complete on this? And if not, let's, let's, let's see what's next. And she just so appreciated that because she was such a deeply feeling child and so deeply and things wouldn't go well. Shanae, thanks for the heart. Yeah. Yeah. So I realize, um, I wonder if that piece would have that kind of impact on Eli to Janae and for all of you who are listening with big kids with big sensitive um, hearts, which by the way, from your intake questions, I'd say is at least 70% of the group <laughs> um, <laughs> that we hear, we hear because of the word resilience, but also mood management and in the intake was like the top one and um, you know, how to handle your child's sensitivities and big emotions and maybe your own often, you know, it doesn't fall far from the tree, right? Um, so Janae, I wonder what you took from that. What would you, what would you try next, you know, with, with your Eli around um, helping him with the revenge piece? Um, and then the other, the other thing that I want to just throw out there is um, practices of letting go for a child who has that revenge piece, you know, and, um, and really giving it back to them though, instead of just saying like, hey, you know, you should really let this go. Like they don't, they tend to not really like that very much. <laughs> Um, if they don't feel it's true for them, they're not ready, right? But you could ask to put it back to them and say, like, what would it take for you to feel result, like, complete enough with this that you won't continue to feel hurt by it? What would, what do you need from your sister or from your dad or from me? You know, right now it's a pretty tight unit, right, Janae? <laughs> um, feel complete about this. Um, and and it's it's a hard question at first, but you'll be surprised. Like I've had four and five year olds say like, well, I need you to help me with my next, you know, my next project first, you know, come to me first before you, you help the other kids. Just so I know that, um, it's important to you that, um, I have what I need. And I was like, Oh my gosh. Okay. Yes. Other times it's just more, it's more straightforward. It's like, I just think I need more time. I need, I need a couple more days of, of, of feeling that you're on my side and which is so deep, you know, and it's so, but so true to them. Other times they'll just be like, I don't know. And then you can offer a menu of options. Like, well, how about we start with a hug or how about we start with me helping you with something that you need help with? Um, and there's all these like fix your mistake ideas too, that we go over in the program and, and in, in my trainings about fixing mistakes and repairing relationships, but just think to some ideas to get you started. So, in summary, looking, trying to read the need behind the behavior, really looking at this framework, Dreyker's framework that, you know, Jane Nelson has really take, taken to the next level of trying to see what the mistaken goal is behind the behavior and, and meeting that will, will really save you some time in the end. Um, just like I said, with like a pulling a weed, if you just pull it, if you, you know, I've, I've got, I'm here in my yard looking at my weeds. I'm like, oh, if I just take the green part off of those weeds over there. <laughs> Um, they're going to be back in the next rain, you know, <laughs> two weeks later, I've been using this tool that gets down to the root and it's more work, man. It's harder. It's a little more labor, but really in the end, you're, you're not only, um, being more efficient with your time and energy, but you're also teaching your kids some really great life skills of tuning into what their real needs are. I've had eight and nine year olds who've been with me for three years, you know, come, come to me and say, I think I'm just after some attention. I don't, I'm not getting enough of it at home. <laughs> it's like, wow, you know, you're so advanced, but it's because we, we talked it through and, and I helped them see that. Like, it seems like you really need a lot of attention today, honey. And I wonder what that's about, you know, and, and not judging them for it. Just being like, that's a, that's a valid need, right? Janae says, I'm especially interested in what he can do if the other person is not available. I think it's about being heard. Yeah, good. Okay, nice one, Janae. So I've had that happen before where there was like a visitor and the visitor like wrecked havoc, wreaked havoc and the kids were like very impacted and we never got to resolve it directly with the child. And so we had some listening circles, right? Where people were able to kind of process what happened. So some doing some deep listening practices and taking notes, like kids love when you write it down because they feel like, wow, you really do. Like my words have enough weight that you're actually gonna take the time to record this. Okay, you know? And um, sometimes it's even writing a letter, the kind of classic like cathartic, like write, write down what you wanna to say to that person, even if you don't get to say it to them. And you can even, in the exercise of that, it's like, well, if you, if you were able to see them right now, what would you say to them? And just giving them the opportunity to say that. 
And then if you were, and then you could even say, if you had the opportunity to like receive something from that person, what would it be? And then, and then have them come up with that. And they could say, let's find a way to give that to you, even though we can't talk to them directly or have them give that to you right now. Um, and no, cause there's also the reality of the other person, maybe not being ready to fix their mistake or willing, right? Yeah. Thanks for the heart, Janae. Glad, glad you got, glad that was helpful. Um, so we need to wrap, but hope you're having a lovely Memorial day. Um, and that you've been able to take some time this weekend to just be together. Um, hopefully spend a little time outdoors if the weather's been permitting in your area and, um, feel into this idea of looking for the mistaken goals, reading the need behind the behavior and addressing those first as a tool for your toolbox. Um, I have some special trainings coming up. We're going to do another Navigating Meltdowns webinar um, in June because it was so popular. We had over over a thousand people visit the registration page, over a hundred people register, um, and a lot of folks listening to the replay who couldn't attend, a bunch of people wanting to talk to me afterward and get some more some more strategies and a bunch of people actually hopped into our year-long program as well that starts in July so it's an opportunity for you to just get some hot quick tips and some, my most popular workshop in June um, I'm also doing something really special and I've been polling you in the group about which is that you know six strategies six days to learn them we're gonna drop in for 20 minutes and I've listened to your requests and I'm gonna do the nap time 2 p.m. Uh, for the 20 minute training and I'm also going to do watch parties in the evening at 8 o'clock for your, your, your central and east coasters and then um, we're going to do a 9 p.m. one for those of you on the west coast um, so that hopefully kids will be in bed and you can watch party with me and we can still jam on the ideas and you can get some support. So I highly recommend you come and just practice those, uh, those strategies with me. I'll be, again, I'll be creating events and inviting everybody in the group. Um, this is a great time to invite more people to the group who you think could use some some of those calm parent strategies and more information like today or navigating meltdowns and how you can do that is just head over to the little invite box. Janae, I know you've done it. You've invited like 12 people to the group. Go head over to the invite section and you know, the more the merrier. It doesn't dilute the group to have more people. Like we really do have waves of inspiration and waves of engagement. So um, it's totally cool if you want to just invite a bunch of people in and tag them in this video, for example, if you found it really useful, that can be really fun. Um, or just, uh, and you know, want them to have all the no notice of notifications of all the events coming up and opportunity to participate. So that's my, that's my little Memorial Day uh, request. Just go head over to the invite area and, and put that in. Um, also let me know always with these videos if there's something specific that you'd really took away and would love for, to remember and carry forward. Um, in your practice as a parent, as, you're in, as you grow and grow as a resilient role model and leader in your family. Lots of love to you. Bye for now. Go hug, go hug your kids. <laughs> okay, I'll see you next time.